So let's get started. Today, our presenter is Dr. Joanna Enterwada. I have had the pleasure to work with her since I joined CUL. She is a professor of natural resource policy and social science in the Department of Environment and Society at Utah State University. Her research focus on water policy, urban landscape, water use, and conservation the human dimension of drought and climate change. I mean, she has done a lot of research on human behavior and how that can influence water conservation. It's all mind blowing. Like I am pretty astonished by what she does. She's part of the project team that has helped bring Growing Water Smart Workshop to Utah. She has also served at state and federal level policy related appointment, including production of, you might know this, Utah's 2017 recommended water state water strategy. And with that, I would like to hand it to you. It's all over to you, Joanna. I'll meet myself and, and be on the back just in case. Uh, I will come up if there is any technical problems. Thank you, Shatal. Thank you so much for your expertise in managing this whole webinar series that we have at Seawell. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy to be a part of it. Thank you for the invitation. Um, Thank you for all for being here today. Um, I'm very happy to have a chance to talk to you. And I wanted to start by mentioning that this is um, a small variation of a presentation that I gave at the UNLA conference in January. And I thank people for their interest and reviews. And I was asked to present this again. And so with some slight additions and modifications here. So I'm going to talk about the role of the green industry in a changing Western water policy landscape. Um, just by way of introduction and what I'm going to base the talk on is that I have an extension appointment. So I do extension work in water policy activities in Utah. And I also have a research focus on urban landscape water conservation, adapting to drought and climate change integration of land and water planning in the Great Salt Lake and its wetlands. And I teach water policy classes and advise graduate students working in policy. So that's sort of the position from which I'm going to draw on today to talk to you. So since this is about the green industry, just as way of introduction, the green industry in includes people in a lot of different professions. And you see those here listed on the left, people who are involved in the nursery and growing industry, retail garden centers, designers, landscape architects, and people generally in the professions that are listed here in plant conservation and soil management, irrigation systems. There are also professional organizations that are part of the green industry. And the UNLA is certainly one of them, the American Planning Association, American Society of Landscape Architects, Association of Professional Landscape Designers, uh, National Association of Landscape, a few different groups, and new coalitions of people that are involved in the public and the private sectors in the Utah Water Conservation Forum and Utah Public Gardens. So thinking broadly across what the green industry means, those of us who are involved in um, some, in some way, in the urban landscapes that we live in and attempting to make the beautiful and to retain our quality of life through them. So there have been some assessments of the contributions of the green industry to the Utah economy. And a couple of years ago, uh, Laura Gale wrote um, a master's paper on track down the contributions. And she noted that while the green industry contributes employment and taxable sales in Utah in 2018, the year the data was available for, the follow-on economic impacts contributed by the green industry are important to consider. And she looked at the number of jobs, 12,000 green industry jo jobs that are throughout the state, but they stimulate 6,679 jobs in the larger economy. And those are in these NIAC codes uh, which is a standard way to classify jobs. So there are a lot of there are contributions to the economy, but there's a lot that the green industry con contributes to our way of life here in Utah, and sometimes those are not easily quantified. 
So I want to talk about the green industry com contributions to Utah policy. And this is where I think the green industry has great contributions to make. So I want to, you to think about a couple of questions to start the webinar today. Um, and I will thread my presentation around answering these. The first one, how can the Utah green industry contribute to addressing water policy challenges in the Western US and particularly in our state? And secondly, what are the implications of changes in Utah water policy for the roles nursery and landscape professionals can play in sustainability transitions? So the presentation today focuses on synthesizing some insights from my extension and research work to address these questions. So first, I want to talk about changing public water policy landscape. So as many of you are aware, Utah has many challenges related to water. We live with aridity, we need to respond to drought, and we have to increasingly adapt to climate change. And this is in the context of continued rapid growth in the water scarce US West and questions about whether and how it is sustainable long term. So that's our context and our challenges. As you know, the state of Utah is split practically down the middle between the Great Basin left here you see and the Colorado River Basin, the Upper Colorado and the Lower Colorado River Basin on the right. Both of those basins have been affected by prolonged drought over the past couple of decades. And the Great Salt Lake watershed lies in the Great Basin and we have seen much attention, policy attention to the decline of the lake and the concerns over its economic and its environmental uh, sustainability over the long term. The Colorado River has many states involved in interstate negotiations on how to divide the water, which was apportioned in a period of time where water was much more plentiful. So those of you who live in Utah certainly know that we were up against challenges throughout the state. <clears throat> Recently, um, the Great Salt Lake Strike Team produced a report in January of 2024. Um, I'm a member of that strike team, and so I just wanted to bring some of the insights to your attention, but they're headed in terms of our hydrology. And some of the key insights from this recent report was that mean annual air temperature in northern Utah has increased more than three degrees Fahrenheit since 1983. So we're seeing these effects warming. There's been an increase in the frequency of consecutive dry years, years with below average precipitation in the 80s. We feel the soil profile and everything between dry years. And cutting edge climate projected over the long term, the expected increase in precipitation from warmer temperatures will be overwhelmed by rising temperatures and evaporation, and that will affect future water availability. So the projections are that water won't necessarily become more plentiful, that we are up against a more long-term challenge of living with in our means of limited water supplies. Utah's also growing and changing in terms of ethics and economics. And a recent report, and just last year from the Chem Gardner Policy Institute at, at the University of Utah noted some of these particular changes. <clears throat> the new Utah is really a more mid-sized state. And in the past, we had more internal growth, and we're going to see more external growth and migration into the state in the coming decades. Um, in the past, we were less multicultural, but we're becoming more and more multicultural as a state. Um, we are also experiencing the aging of our population. And so we're having older um, people in need of different housing and different circumstances. 
Um, we've had a strong economy for a long time, but now uh, the Kim Gardner Center says we're really headed for an elite economy. We are a place that people are investing. And we've had affordable uh, housing in the past, so we're increasingly seeing less affordable housing available. Now, all of these, I just point these out because what happens with people coming to the state and where they live and how we build to accommodate them has a great deal to do with uh, the landscaping industry because it will be part of this growth trend. <laughs> in Utah water policy in recent years. And I'm just focus them here for you. And these changes have been seen people who are part of the water community and who've observed water policy for many decades have commented and increasingly comment on changes that are occurring. And we're in a period of rapid change in water policy. So here are some of the changes. We're confronting the uncertainties in supplies. That is a less reliable way to plan for the future, to expect that we will develop new supplies. <clears throat> We've been shifting the focus to water demand management strategies. Uh, the state is promoting water smart growth with an emphasis on new development, recognizing that all development that goes in needs to be as efficient as possible because that development has a long lifespan. And if it's not at the leading edge of efficiency from the start, we'll be behind in trying to be efficient. <clears throat> There's an increased urgency to achieve conservation and efficiency results because of the challenges we're facing in both the Great Basin, the Great Salt Lake, and the Colorado River. A lot of legislation has been passed in recent years, and generally it has been focused on promoting conservation, accounting for water and its use, uh, transparency, in water data and more flexibility in how we can attempt to incentivize and move water around between areas of need and areas where maybe uh, some conservation can occur. <clears throat> We're also seeing some shift from education and incentives as way to encourage change to more requirements uh, because we need to um, get everybody moving in the same direction and on the same page. Um, and then we're also recognizing need for coordinated, coordinated action. And that's across scales, local scale, regional scale, state scale, and then larger region, these watersheds that we're part of. And also across sectors, a real need to cooperate between residential sector, commercial sector, industrial, institutional. <clears throat> Many of you are familiar with this, but... This is here to point out that water conservation measures have been key, uh, and Governor Cox has uh, promoted these. The legislature has backed them up with funding for these. Uh, we've had an expanded back program, statewide installation of secondary water meters, lots of uh, uh, appropriations to help with that, integrated land, use of water planning, and ag optimization. So these big conservation measures have been on the plate in terms of the legislation that's been passed and the appropriations that have been made to help make this happen. <clears throat> Just overall quickly, you can find these summaries of this and on the next slide of some water legislation in 2022, and the next one will be on 2023, that are on the um, Division of Water Resources website. <clears throat> but as you can see, there have been a number of different bills that have focused on these trends that I just mentioned. And so you can take a look at those a little bit more carefully, but these are some summaries of what happened in 2022 to illustrate the fact that we're in a period of policy change. In 2023, additional legislation occurred in these areas providing resources and requiring certain things of conservancy districts, requiring certain things of homeowner associations, of individuals. So um, more legislation in 2023. Again, in 2024, we have some legislation up related to water. And I'm just going to point out that 
our legislative session is going on, as you know, and there are places to track these bills that are going through related to water. You can go to the Utah State Legislature website and under their tab of bills, you can go down here to a tracking service and you can track bills and you will get um, tracking services to tell you where the bills are in process. Jeff Gittins um, with Smith Harvison has a good blog and he actually uh, has a 2024 legislative preview snapshot of it, but House Bill 111, Water Efficient Landscaping Requirements, uh, is one of the bills that's up. So a bunch of different bills and his synopsis of those. There are other places, too, that you can track legislation. For example, a lot of environmental groups are tracking legislation because they're concerned about water conservation. The Friends of Great Salt Lake is an organization uh, focused on uh, measures to help uh, get more water to the lake and help sustain the lake. So they have legislative updates and priority bills on their website. It's listed here for you. Salt Lake Tribune has a Utah bill tracker that you can follow. So there are quite a number of places that you can see what's going on in the legislature this year in the realm of water. The other thing I wanted to bring to your attention to make the case about this context of water policy change is that Emily Lewis with Clyde Snow, um, a law firm, has done some work in Great Salt Lake Basin Integrated Plan. And at this website, you can find this memorandum where she does a nice overview of changes that have occurred in recent years and then documented on this policy matrix, if you click on that, um, on that website, I'll take you to a matrix where there's a lot of information on the different bills that have been passed and what they mean for um, where we're headed. The other thing I wanted to point out is that Utah, uh, at the highest levels, at the governor and under the governor's leadership, has created a Utah's Coordinated Action Plan for Water. And this has been a plan that got all the relevant to try to work on promoting conservation and other elements of moving us into the future on how we manage water. Now, all these changes have some implications for the green industry that I want to point out. In terms of landscapes, we're realizing what we grow and irrigate and how we do it matters. This is true both in the agricultural sector and in the urban sector. And there is increasing attention to attempt to quantify the consumptive amount of water that we use, um, because that would be water that would not be reaching the Great Salt Lake or available for other uses. And in the urban environment, of course, landscapes consume a lot more water, indoor water use, much of that close to 90% returns to the system. And so what we grow and how we irrigate it and how we do that matters. Um, the role the, uh, of the green industry. Private developer and landscaping industries really have a critical role to play in water policy implementation. The legislature can pass laws to help move us in a particular direction. Just on the ground, implementing the policy, making changes requires the help of citizens, industries, governments. Um, and so we all have a role to play, but has a role and opportunities here. And that's the last point, opportunity. The, the green industry, industry can really proactively support this new direction in policy change. So the next thing I want to talk about a little bit is green industry professionals and where there is a role uh, for professionals to play. So I want to start out by making a point about the of what we put on the landscape 
and how we build our communities. And the fact that there are decisions associated with all of that. Um, the mo most influential decisions, I would argue, um, water decisions are ones that establish expectations, habits, and use patterns that shape water demand and that can be hard to change. So whenever we're building something, the form that that takes will create certain expectations will that will carry forward into the future. And landscape design and installation are important. How they shape water use patterns is really important to alter the trajectory of water demand associated with growth. So we're facing growth and how we grow matters. And the green industry has a role to play in that. So there are a lot of different kinds of decisions. And these are decisions that I will argue the green industry has a role in influencing. There are public policy and planning decisions, commercial decisions, institutional decisions, landscaping decisions, and certainly the consumer decisions. So I want to go through these a little bit, one by one, what kinds of decisions are being made? And you as an audience, I would like to have think about the role that you could play in these decisions. First, public policy and planning decisions are real important. They affect urban water, new development in certain locations, establishing different urban forms and densities, implementing building and landscaping codes and ordinances and setting water pricing structures. So these public policy and planning decisions are important. Commercial decisions are also important, and they're related to the water fixtures, the irrigation technologies, and nursery products that companies choose. They decide to produce, use themselves, service, and or sell. And that can have a big influence on residential, commercial, industrial, or institutional water use. It is the end of the pipe water infrastructure that we need to be concerned about and that's where many of us have individual decisions and group decisions household decisions that we can make <clears throat> landscaping decisions of course are key because of the amount of water uh, used in the urban sector that is for landscaping well over 60 percent um, and landscaping decisions, as you all know, if you're interested in the green industry, relate to the types of urban vegetation to plant, how to water it. Uh, that will affect outdoor water use and local landscape design installation and maintenance companies can significantly influence consumers and clients' landscaping decisions and affect long-term patterns of urban water use. Institutional decisions are important, particularly important. Um, and these often apply to large property holdings. For example, all government buildings, parks throughout a city, or all the households located within a homeowner or condominium association. And institutional water conservation actions are important for other reasons. Primarily, they serve as a really prominent and visible public example of um, that can influence the behaviors of other members of a community. And so some of the legislation passed in recent years has been on what is required of government buildings so that government can help set the example in this trend. Individual consumer decisions also are very important. And they range from where we choose to live, what water devices and services we purchase, how much water to use, how much we're willing to pay for. Uh, all of that affects urban water demand, particularly in terms of the cumulative effects when many people engage in similar behaviors. And so individuals have a role to play too. So just again, lots of decision points where we set something down that can last for a long time, we create expectations, and being active and speaking up in those decision-making processes is a way to help uh, transition Utah to more sustainable water use. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit now about some findings that we had from a recent survey we did 
for the Great Salt Lake. A few things that you, I want to point out that you might find interesting. Uh, this article appeared in the Water Report, Strategies to Secure Water for the Great Salt Lake. And um, I want to present a little, a few of the results of that, and then I'll tell you where you can go get the whole article. But we uh, surveyed households across the entire state through all the different counties, but we broke them into three strata, Great Salt Lake counties, other watershed counties, and the rest of Utah counties. So in these tables I'm going to show you, we show the county strata, and then we also show an average for all. But we asked people, the focus of the survey is what would they be willing to do individually? What would they support? And what do they support at the state level in terms of actions taken for water conservation? So this first one is about actions that individuals are willing to take. And the question posed to them was, as an individual, how willing are you to take the following actions, assuming these actions would contribute to efforts to secure water for Great Salt Lake? And the... This table presents the percentage of respondents who, who mark slightly or very willing. This was a scale of one to five with a neutral three in the middle and one to two is not very willing and four um, and five were willing. And you can see, so these are all, all were slightly willing or very willing. In the four or five category, is fairly high for most of these. Interestingly, the very the thing people were most willing to do was to use contractors who are certified in water efficient landscaping to design, install, or maintain my landscape and irrigation system when needed. We thought that was very interesting that that appeared at, at the top of the list and people are, are wanting to help as I'll show you with uh, some of the sustainability transitions that we're undergoing in the state. And so there, there is a role here for the green industry to help people change their landscapes. And I know lots of people who are in the market to have their change. They're also willing to go dormant and turn brown more than uh, almost 65%. I just got a signal that my internet is a little unstable, so hopefully this is going to keep working. Okay. Um, uh, it's it's so working, yeah. It's kind of a little bit, um, uh, it's it's not as smooth, but it, we can understand it. It's, it's, it's working. Okay. I've turned everything else off that I can. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Um, so in terms of... Um, Having certified landscape professionals, just wanted to point out that Center for Water Efficient Landscaping has a quell training program that is run in combination with the UNLA, Jordan Valley Water Conservancy District, as part of a national program. And in Utah, um, uh, the Center for Water Efficient Landscaping uh, helps run this program. And if you get a quell certification, qualified water efficient landscaper, uh, you can actually go on a, there is a map um, that goes on with this, with the National Quell, and people can look up for their postal zip code um, names of people who have been through this, bring that to your attention, since that's something that people want. Um, in terms of motivations to reduce household water use, depending on how um, the water will be used, we asked people, how motivated would you be to reduce your own household's water use if you knew the water you conserve would be put toward the following uses? And what you can see, people who are moderately or very motivated um, to improve a lot of environmental values, those got high rankings. But in terms of saving water to allow increased development in their area, they are not very willing that this is the third time we've asked a question like this on a survey over the last 20 years and it is consistently the lowest rated but the meaning of that is it really 
makes it imperative that new development occurs in a very water efficient way to help justify the fact that it is in essence adding more water use to a water system. So um, people are willing to support government or utility actions to secure water. They want to ensure water supplies adequate experience. Um, many of them, this is, a, this is the mean on a scale of one to five. So all of these are above the middle, meaning there are people are generally willing to do these things um, or they're supportive of these things. And so mandating outdoor water restrictions during shortage, adopt them, adopting, implementing land use ordinances and building codes are supportive of that, limiting the amount of turf available in outdoor installations and renovations. And there are also of increased prices to reflect the full cost. Of You're seeing that the public is moving in the direction of what they would like and what they're going to be looking for on the market. And this will affect the green industry. Uh, in terms of their support for various state government actions, a couple of things. They want prioritization of water demand management, conservation efficiency and reuse over new water supply development. Um, and they also want to promote significant reductions in Utah's per capita water use. So you can take a look at this particular article and at least get some takeaways from it. In terms of how they generally rank goals for managing Utah's water resources, they generally want to ensure supply of drinking water and water quality and water for agriculture. So uses that will um, support human um, needs. They want to, and these are, this is a scale of what is your highest priority? And they were asked to prioritize these from one to nine, one being the highest, nine being the lowest. So human uses, protecting the Great Salt Lake and wetlands and wildlife, and then ensuring supply for economic development or paying tax, uh, saving taxpayer money, ensuring supply of water for residential landscaping and providing recreational opportunities were the lower priority. So I'm just sort of showing that. And so Residential landscaping, as with agriculture, has come under some scrutiny and some criticism at times. Uh, in Utah, we hear that referred to amenity uses that might not be important. And so moving landscaping toward uh, less water is definitely on the public's agenda. So here's a place where you can download this particular publication. So that publication has been a selected portion of a much larger study about the future of Great Salt Lake. I know this re pertains to Northern Utah, but here's where you can get the full report. And in the full report, we bring out some major key themes um, that we found across the survey as a whole. Just to point out and to emphasize again that values and interests of Utahns may be changing. Uh, Utahns are aware of the issues facing a drying Great Salt Lake and they care about its future. Our second finding was they view their quality of life as linked to the health of the Great Salt Lake ecosystem. Third finding, Utahns express commitment to preserving the Great Salt Lake. Key finding number four, people want to see state and community actions to save the Great Salt Lake, and they're also willing to take actions individually. A fifth finding, people want to be more informed about how the government is responding to a drying Great Salt Lake. And interestingly, despite the amount of legislation that has been passed in recent years, many people aren't aware of the legislation that the state has been passing. And so there are for landscapers to help inform um, their clients of uh, the things that have passed. Uh, 
Key finding number six, people prioritize basic human and ecosystem uses of water over economic and what they consider non-essential uses. And finally, uh, key finding number seven was Utahns emphasized a collective responsibility for the lake and a sense of loss if we cannot protect it. So that's a big issue for live in Northern Utah. One other thing, Again, showing trends of change, both in the public and in the governmental sphere. There's a uh, integration of water, land of water and land planning is on the state's agenda. Uh, the Division of Water Resources received some funding to uh, hold Growing Water Smart workshops. Uh, the Center for Water Efficient Landscaping has been part of a contracting team to help implement that program, and. <clears throat> We have held several workshops so far, three, and we're planning a fourth for May. Um, most recent January, early January, we had a Southwestern Utah Growing Water Smart workshop. You can see the cities and the communities, the county was involved, along with seven cities that are all part of the uh, Washington County Water Conservancy District service area. Um, in the Virgin River Basin, down in the southwest portion of the state, there is Growing Water Smart guidebook that we created for each of the workshops. This is the most recent one, and you might want to take a look at that. It, you can find it on the Seawall website, but it is one that has an additional resources section that I wanted to bring to your attention with lots of links to programs related to growing water smart, to water conservation in general, and a lot of resources that you may be able to utilize. <clears throat> so we held one in June of last year at Utah State University. Here you see the participant communities, and our inaugural one was held in November of 2022. So again, this is just another move where communities are interested in attempting to grow more water smart and moving in the direction of sustainability. <clears throat> so some implications for the green industry. First of all, influence. Your landscape knowledge and experience can influence many decisions over how to conserve water and how to grow water smart. And in terms of clients, your clients express a willingness to change their landscapes, but they often don't know how, and they need your help and expertise. And so I would say for the green industry, knowledge is your niche. I know you provide services and products, but knowledge in their landscapes is extremely important. And finally, the implication in terms of communities is the U Utah green industry as a whole can inform and support local communities and the changes that they are trying to implement, for example, with ordinances. <clears throat> so finally, in this section, I wanna just talk about this knowledge as a niche for the green industry. So we know that <clears throat> much of indoor water use has become more efficient just through the building codes and the changes in fixtures and appliances that have occurred over time. But greater efficiency is not as easily engineered in outdoor water use. And gaining efficiency in landscape watering really requires understanding the human interface with irrigation technologies and plants in urban locations with high site variability. And this is where the green industry really has the important knowledge as a niche because they know how to design for the different types of locations, locations with steep slopes, locations without steep, steep slopes, ones with different constraints to efficiency. And there are many things on the front end in new construction and things that can be done in existing landscapes to increase that efficiency. And that's where the knowledge that the green industry brings to bear is a tremendous asset. And again, just... <clears throat> 
reminding you about these decision points that are extremely important, the role that the green industry can play in influencing them. A lot of times, uh, people in the landscaping industries will respond to what clients say they want, but there's oftentimes a um, discussion and for education in the trends that are occurring in the green industry has a role to play in informing people of these trends, offering them alternatives, and showing them some of the trade-offs. And making the case that what gets installed, especially in a landscape that's likely to last 20 to 30 years, will have a long-term implication on water use. And so those are important conversations um, to have, not only within the green industry community, but with the clients. So the Utah green industry role um, in this, I'd like to point out, I think individual members working with their clients and their colleagues um, have a role to play, this educational role that I've been talking about. They can influence clients in their decision making. And in a way, they can help embed these some water contingency planning into landscape designs with plant materials that can undergo periods of drought and be healthy over the long term with certain turf grass that can go dormant and then can come back um, when water is more available. So planning for this water situation that we see headed in the direction of more scarcity. But I also want to point out that action can be taken within green industry. Green industry can exercise leadership in industry transition towards sustainability. They can help make the case for water smart change and input into policy formulation at the local, regional, and state um, scales. So the green in part to play in engaging in sustainability transitions, and that's where we're headed. There's an academic literature on this topic, sustainability transitions, and it's really motivated by the urgency to address complex global problems. Much of this literature emanates from your climate change, but it's because we have an urgent to make changes and make them quickly uh, in order to respond and the growth situation that we're in. So in this literature, um, it recognizes the importance of several things. Um, first, there are multiple transition pathways, and so there's a lot of room for experimentation to find position and then that's what we're working on, and that's what a lot of the policy legislation is about here in Utah, is finding ways to transition our economy um, and our water use patterns. Um, transformations can be abrupt or emerge more gradually over time. This literature points this out. And then a part of a gradual transformation from supply uh, new supply development to water demand management, but there are other transformations to respond to situations like the Great Salt Lake uh, and need that to occur. The visioning and strategy work of actor networks and coalitions of people um, are real important too in helping make these transitions. And so the green industry, when you th think broadly across that industry and all those actors that I mentioned at the very first, um, this employed within those organizations can be very helpful. Um, multi they, this literature also talks about multi-scalar dynamics and how you really link local scale change to broader scale changes and that's why I made the case that this is across scales. We have to look at the local, the regional um, and the state level to make changes that will cumulatively have significant results. There's a lot of experimentation and social learning that goes on to help turn transformative innovations into mainstream practices and so something may be 
how can we make it mainstream? And that is really what will embed a new way of living with aridity responding to drought and adapting to climate change. But there can be tensions involved in sort of unlocking this and then embedding and institutionalizing more innovative alternatives. So this is part of the challenge before us, a challenge that I'm arguing the green industry has a role to play in. So just to summarize, so we have a little time for conversation, uh, green industry com contributions to policy and the questions I posed at the first. And so my summary uh, comments here, my closing insight is the Utah green industry has opportunities and critical roles to play in helping Utah to align public policy change with private industry economic change. That will help Utah conserve water, water while also maintaining vibrant and healthy urban communities and contributing to secure Utah's future. So with that, I will end and leave some time for some questions. I'll leave that last okay. slide up. <clears throat> Thanks, Joanna. Uh, this was really insightful. Now, let's go with the question that we have in the Q&A box. Rick Smith, in talking with water districts, a large part of conserve, quote unquote, like the conserve is in quote, in talking with water districts, a large part of conserve water will become the water for future growth development. If not, they will have to go develop or import more water as, at a large expense. New legislation is causing water to be more expensive. Will the economics of water use, water change, water use more, or will the general water ethos evolve over time due to all of the media attention and studies? So it's a it's a complex question. How uh, you can take it, Joanna? And if you want to read it, it's in Q and A. So. Oh, okay. <clears throat> It's more like, will the economics of water change, wa water use, like will the economics change the water use uh, more, or will the general water ethos uh, evolve over time due to all of the media attention and studies? How will we change the water use? I mean, economics or just the media coverage and education, or both? Well, Rick, thank you for your question. And you're right, that a large part of served water for future growth and development, but there are models and the Alliance for Water Efficiency has one on water neutral growth. Um, a lot of cities have experienced growth and at the same time have reduced their water use over time. And so Utah really needs to look seriously at water neutral growth in the urban sector um, in the hopes, and this is something the Great Salt Lake Strike Team pointed out in their 2023 report, and that's on the website that I mentioned, that if you could with more water noodle, then it would allow for more transactions for conserved water from agriculture to go to the Great Salt Lake and to help um, with environments. So um, where the conserved water goes is a really, really important question. Um, but developing new sor sources very feasible right now. And we've seen that with the Lake Powell pipeline, for instance, that uh, Washington County thought would be built by now, but is um, not feasible politically or economically at the present time. And so, yes, I think Utah uh, water will become more expensive. Um, and the ethos about water use, I think, is driven partly by, well, right now, it's not as much driven by economics because we still have fairly low water prices, but it is being driven by people's concern over environmental health and seeing environmental health, say, of the Great Salt Lake and human health and the dust from uh, dry Great Salt Lake um, bed is of concern to many people. So um, I agree with your observations. But there has been a lot of media attention. 
The Great Salt Lake Collaborative has brought a lot, a lot of attention to the Great Salt Lake issues here in northern Utah. And um, people are hearing that and they're responding to that. That's part of what that's, those survey results, um, I hope, tried to show you. Awesome. Thanks, Joanna. And uh, okay. we, we have other questions, but before that, I just wanted to let you know that if you need certificates of attendance, please email Susan Buffler. Uh, I have put the, her email in the chat. Uh, she will provide it to you. If you need Doppel course EU, uh, UNL is also helping us get those Doppel course EU or CEUs where we need to contact agencies. So email at memberservices at uh, utahgreen.org. Um, and once we opt out, you will get a link to provide in your survey, survey and feedback. Please do that. It's really useful for us. Uh, but then the, the other question that we have from Eric Bunker is any insights or help into applying public policy without infringe, infringement or the feel of infringement of water rights? Well, in Utah, thank you, Eric, for that question. Um, and in Utah water law, uh, just so you know, the very first sentence of Utah water law is the property of the public rights to use water, but it's different from um, a property right. Water is something we own in common. So we recognize the rights in the center in Utah has certainly recognized rights by trying to incentivize water conservation through appropriations and economic grants, like for ag optimization, um, recognizing that those uh, people have rights to use water. So those are on water rights, but trying to incentivize some change in current practices to become more water efficient or to conserve more water so that it can accommodate more use. Thanks. Uh, the next one from Ray is, it, it appeared that the survey found that the majority of respondents did not ab advocate for higher density housing to conserve water resources. My assumption from this was that many respondents opposed did not live in master plan or high density developments and we and were opposed as a result of current living situation. Do we know if this is true? If so, how can green industry and future policy around the green industry target rural sector of housing and landscaping for a greater impact? It's a long question, so. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ray, for the question, and um, I hope I'm addressing it with what I have to say, but you're right that there are a lot of people that high-density housing in their backyard was not something. It was phrased in the survey um, in their neighborhood, and they are not necessarily supportive of that yet because of housing affordability and a newer generation of home buyers that might not necessarily want to have large landscapes to maintain. In addition to this aging population that really wants to downsize if affordable housing were available, leave larger homes and larger lots for um, families and move into something else is a question that we um, need to face in Utah. And so this connection between how we grow, the landscape implications of that, the water use implications and density um, is a really important one. But housing affordability and water management are coming together on that issue. That those two issues intersect, I should put it that way. And so um, <clears throat> I think the green industry, the last part of your question, if so, how can the green industry and future policy around the green industry target a rural sector of housing and landscaping um, for greater impact? I'm not sure if I understand that, but there is a lot of change in rural communities as well. We experienced that with the workshop that we had in southwestern Utah um, in January with a lot of rural communities that 
faced with very hard in future and some of the conflicts in the transition that are going on there and their ability to respond to that um, quickly enough. So appreciate the question and the thoughts in, involved in that. Thank yes. you. Yes. Uh, the other one is very crucial, which is all, which is also in my mind. For those that want to conserve water and use less, or perhaps on the larger scale, donate water to Great Salt Lake. How do they ensure that water is going downstream ultimately to Great Salt Lake and not being used up by construction or development? Kayla, that's a very important question, and thank you for that. <clears throat> The Great Salt Lake Trust was set up by the legislature to acquire water rights for the Great Salt Lake through leases or purchases. And one of the key issues is shepherding that water to the lake. So if a water right is purchased and there's an attempt to move it to the lake, how does it actually get there and pass other water users along the way who could divert? instead and so one of the key needs right now is for more instrumentation and monitoring of water as it flows through the system and there is um, a recommendation on the part of the Great Salt Lake strike team for that and there are some appropriations that the legislature is looking at to help with that and so um, that is a really important question because people want to know that the water they conserve or if they're motivated to for a particular reason they would like to know that their conserved water is going to meet some of the need they had hoped it would serve so very great salt lake that is so something that's a possibility for people to do uh, you probably read that the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints had donated a water right to the lake um, last year. And so that is also something that's available to individuals to do. And that is a big decision people can make if they happen to have water rights uh, and can donate it. And it depends on the blocks of water and how to move that water. But great question. Yeah, great awesome. question. And uh, Joanna, please share this presentation with me when you're done, and I will share it with someone. Like uh, Evelyn wants some URLs from your presentation, so if you can share. I think you shared, but it didn't come up, so if you can do that, it would be awesome. Again, I have another thing to say. These are recorded, and these will be in our YouTube channel, Waterwell with Seawell. Uh, with that, uh, thank you, Joanna. It was very uh, nice learning about all these policies and how these can change our like human behavior and thoughts. And, and yeah, that's, uh, we are glad to have you. Mm -hmm.